Black Album. Mm -hmm. DJ Mao's in a garage mixes the Black Album and the White Album to create something called the Grey Album, mm -hmm. right? And he produces like some 300 copies of this in the, of, of, of the CD. And he gets a notice from the owners of the copyright of the White Album to say that he's an infringement of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Now this became a pretty kind of a sore point for a number of people who thought this is insane. This is a David and Goliath scenario. This mm -hmm. large kind of studio house suing this small DJ. So a, a, a protest called the Black Tuesday protest was set up online where 17 different websites mirrored the Grey Album. Within a month there were a million downloads of the Grey Album, effectively making him the biggest selling artist of that year, beating you know, honorable people like Nora Jones and Britney Spears, right? So, but here is a scenario where technology and the internet does two things. It allows for a change in the way that music is created, but more importantly, it allows for a change, a massive change in the way that music is distributed and kind of, you know, consumed. Mm -hmm. And that's where the licensing question kind of becomes important because if one were to try to think of where the intersection between copyright and emerging business models kind of, you know, come together. One place where they come together is traditional licensing, right? So the owner of the copyright has a strict set of licenses which you are either allowed or not allowed to use certain things. Uh, but there's another way of thinking about the business of, of copyright itself. And this is uh, something that can be demonstrated online by a principle that Chris Anderson describes as the long tail. Any guesses on what the long tail is? Do you know what the Pareto principle is? Yeah, Pareto optimum. Yes. What is the Pareto optimum? Where you, if you change anything from that point in time, it's not going to. I mean, like it's. It's going inefficient. To. Yeah. So, the Pareto principle came from the simple uh, recognition that he had that, on the whole, it seemed to be true both in nature and in social life that a small percentage. 20% of, let's say, a population owned 80% of the land or controlled 80% of the resources, right? He called this the 80-20 rule. Now, he stretched this into other domains and found that this was equally true. So, for example, even in grain peas, he found that, God, this was true, that, you know, most of the peas were coming from, like, you know, 20% of the thing. And started then working towards the idea of the Pareto Optimum. But when applied to business, what this leads to is basically the blockbuster principle, right? What does this mean? There are 100 films that are released every year. Most of them are flops. Most of them are disastrous flops, and yet the film industry runs. Why? Because 20% of the films that are released will account for 100% of the thing. Now, you take this in terms of retail and in terms of shopping. Same principle that 20% of the goods that are sold accounts for the overall profit of you know a shop or a bookstore. But what this also has implications in terms of you know of uh, of the way that our cultural consumption and the cultural economy works is the blockbuster. If I am a distributor, if I'm a music company, or if I'm a, a, a film producer, my focus will be on the blockbuster as opposed to the niche specialized market. It does not make sense for me to focus on this. So what this results in are two things. One is visibility. Second, shelf life. So the chances of you going into a bookstore and finding a Sydney Sheldon are much higher than the chances of you finding an author like, I don't know, Hugh Ken or Guy Davenport. It's not going to happen. These people are not going to be found because their shelf life is going to be determined on the basis of which part of the thing that they are on, right? So what this increasingly results in, in, in terms of a, a concern for all of us, is the homogenization of the world in terms of cultural consumption, right? Because if you start looking at this entire thing, you basically have a scenario of what is known as the very long and thin tail here. Now, Chris Anderson in his book, The Long Tail, says that the internet comes and does something very strange and very different. He takes Amazon and he takes Barnes and Nobles and he looks at their catalog, which consists of a large number of books apart from Sydney Sheldon, 
or Harry Robbins in terms of the, the best sellers. There are people that you would never find in a bookstore, but who can be on online. And he goes to figure out, he says, okay, in a quarter, how many of these, you know, 80% are selling at least one copy in a quarter? Take a guess. A few. 98%. So he makes the argument, changing the Pareto rule, the 2080 rule, to saying that the internet does something very drastic. It brings in an entirely new way of understanding the business and the economy of film and music. And he says what you have now is the long tail. Right? So this will still remain. The blockbuster principle still remains. So that if you go to a landmark, etc., the likelihood of your encountering the blockbuster, and in music, very clear. You take all of the bands who you will not find. Will you find a Mangujeri in landmark? Impossible, right? But you will find Mangujeri on, you know, either on iTunes or on Pirate Bay. 100% that you'll find it. Take the Indian rock scene. One of the most important albums that came out, Rock Machine, as in terms of the history of indie rock. Where will you find it? Right? So the long tail for him consists of a way in which we can think of how the indie scene can be strengthened. And there are two things that he said. He says one is how do we extend the tail? And the second is how do we widen the tail? Right? So his argument in some ways allows us to think about what kind of a licensing model works for what kind of you know, business. The traditional copyright licensing works perfectly well for the Pareto model, right? Because what you need is a very strict and controlled manner in which your blockbuster circulates. So if you take in, in film, there's something known as the windowing mechanism. The windowing mechanism in film is very simple. You divide the world according to time and according to space, and the circulation of the copyrighted good moves in time and space according to your control. So I initially release a film in North America, because that's my primary market. Then I release it in Europe, then I release it in Asia Pacific, then I release it in Latin America, and finally in Africa, right? And that also explains for DVD region code, the most ridiculous technology on, on, on Earth. But this works very well for that, because it's meant and designed for a certain manner of the flow of commodities, right, of cultural commodities. But when it comes to the long tail, it does not work too well. Because what you want in the long tail is a certain idea of visibility and you want shelf life. Which in any case, if you were either a musician who had signed away your rights, etc., you would not be in control of them. And that's really where the alternatives have started to emerge in terms of you know, things like the creative commons, which act as ways in which you can actually imagine licensing out a cultural commodity uh, with more control than you would have if you had assigned your rights. Just one kind of a legal thing to remember on assignment in India is that there is a protection inbuilt in the Indian Copyright for Act for Assignment, which is that if the assignee has not exercised their rights in five years, there is a right of reversion. Uh, in section 1918, which allows you to, in a way, for the work to come back to you. Because this is a common complaint that a number of uh, musicians have, which is that I signed my contract with you know, a Sony, and after a while, they found that it's not worth their while to distribute me. Now, this was a very common problem in the 80s in India with Ghazal singles. HMP at that point of time controlled 92% of the Indian market. Blockbuster principle, right? But all their revenue came only from a small 20% of their catalog, Hindi film songs, which meant that every other genre, 